You're now listening to the Wandering Buffalo podcast with your hosts, Andrew Chang and Justin Goddard. Hello and welcome to the Wandering Buffalo podcast. My name is Andrew Chang and alongside me is my co-host, Justin Goddard. Tonight, we're going to talk about our views and opinions on Brandon Bean and the coaching staff. As always, you can find us on social media and podcasting platforms and even on YouTube by searching The Wandering Buffalo Podcast. I'm so excited to talk about this bright spot of the franchise. And of course, before we get started, Justin, how are you feeling today? Bro, you know how I am right now. It is draft week. I'm hyped. I don't know. I don't know if it's just because of all the years of the Bills being terrible and me just loving the draft or if it's like that that moment I need to break up this long off season, but draft week just gets me going. I'm so excited. Yeah, I'm, we're, we're going to actually about we're going to talk about that in a second. But before we get into it, if I sound a little different, it's because I'm technically on vacation right now, so I don't have any of my recording equipment on me. So if you noticed that that slight change of audio, that's that's the reason why. Um, but before we dive into the episode, let's talk about some Bills-related news. Justin, you already alluded to it. The NFL Draft is here. It starts Thursday, April 29th, and it goes to May 1st. I'm super excited to talk about what the Bills do, and I'm interested in it. Maybe we trade up. Maybe we trade down. I doubt it. Or maybe we stay. Who knows? And hopefully by the end of it, this Javion Hawkins talk can just be put in the past. The Javion Hawkins talk will never go away. Oh, my God. Mark my words, that dude's going to make it. Oh, my God. Well, if he comes on the team, I'm literally never going to hear that end of it, I swear. Nope. <laughs> it's gonna be, that's that's going to be the New Jersey. It doesn't matter if like we get... But, um, why did Andrew end out of Florida? Why did Andrew quit the podcast? Yeah, who's the tight end out of Florida? I, Pitts. I, I, oh yeah, Kyle Pitts. Yeah, it doesn't even matter if we got Kyle Pitts. You would buy literally the Hawkins jersey over the Kyle Pitts just to one, spite me. One thousand percent. Oh my god, without a doubt. <laughs> Anyways, uh, the other Bills related news is that according to TMZ, Stefan Diggs six-figure car was found abandoned like feet feet away in miami uh, from a like a railroad track kind of seems weird but allegedly he let his friend borrow it they got a flat tire and then he just left the car there i don't know about you justin but if i'm lending my friend if i'm lending you my car and you get a flat tire, and then you just leave it out there overnight, and it, it gets towed, I'm going to be kind of upset with you. <laughs> yeah, there, there's something suspect going on there, and mm-hmm. I honestly, I hope that Stefan Diggs actually let somebody borrow the car, and maybe they were intoxicated or something and got the flat tire and panicked. Mm-hmm. Um Honestly, I've done some more digging on the story, and I haven't really turned up anything yet. Yeah. But really hope Stefan Diggs isn't involved in something nefarious there. Yeah. Well, I don't think that there's evidence pointing to the contrary, so I think yeah. we're all good. It's it's the sneak effect, though. You know, you, you get away with something, you get away with something, and all of a sudden it catches up with you. So I just hope that he really has nothing to do with whatever happened there very yeah. strange story yeah well hopefully uh it can be put in the past <laughs> you know before i actually uh, got home to do this recording i was playing tennis with uh my buddy steve uh and he's so good at tennis and we were playing with this new random guy along with claire the voice of the podcast and he's like one of those people that likes to think he knows it all and he was just like no you can't do this or you can't do that and it's funny because my buddy steve is a actual tennis instructor and was just like yeah you can you can say all the stuff that you want but you have to know the rules and you got to be right about it and 
I feel like in my head, that's how Brandon Bean thinks. Like he, that's how I hold him in my head. Like this man knows everything. He's done everything so right. So we're gonna talk about him today, and let's get into him. Brandon Bean, big baller Bean for a reason. They call him that for a reason, Justin. It's it's because he's like financially responsible. Like you remember with Doug Whaley that year that we picked up all those players and paid stupid money for them. We gave Mr. Big Stuff that huge $100 million contract. We got Charles Clay. And then we went like 9-7 and seven after that. Like, unreal. I, I, I don't know, but Brandon Bean always seems to find ways to structure contracts with an out. I think about like Quentin Spain. He's always able to get out of a contract if he wants to. He's like the reverse Doug Whaley. <laughs> um, speaking of which, since we're going to the draft, I highly anticipate that he's going to move up. I don't know about you, Justin. I think he's going to move up in the first or the second. He's, it's just in his DNA. I don't suspect he'll trades down. What would be like the over-under if he did? Uh, I would say I, I would agree with you that, especially in a draft where – you know, you probably aren't taking seven players that make this team right now. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's more towards like trading back up to get into the fourth round because we don't have a pick there. And I think there's going to be some guys he likes there. Mm -hmm. You get to the sixth, seventh round and you got some, some players that like, will they make the team? Will they, will they be practice squad guys? Um, I see it more likely as him tinkering with like a fourth round pick. Yeah. But depending, there's so much dependent on how the board's falling at 30. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think he's much more likely to be doing some sort of trade ups. Um, Mm -hmm. He's shown in the past, he's very about like, if this is my guy, this is where he is on the board and I can go get him. He's not waiting to see if they fall to him. Right. So. One of the things I love about Brandon Bean is he seems to have like this bevy of experience and he's still so young. Like he, he especially in terms of like general managers, like he seems like he's been worked through every scenario that might come up and he's still so young in the game. I'm just always so interested to see what he's doing next, what he's cooking up. Right. And I think I think that's a good point because if he's this good, being so young into his career, that just, if anything, that just tells me he can get even better, right? Right. And he's not hes not afraid to take these big swings in the draft. You think about Josh Allen, moved up for it. You think about Tremaine Edmonds, moved up for him. We walked away looking at that draft going, at least for me, we got a pivotal part of our offense and on defense right off the bat. So I I love the fact that he's willing to make those swings. If you see someone you like who's high on the board, who shouldn't be there, why would you not go up and get it? So and I think that's I think that's where I'm gonna actually bring in my personal opinion, his best move as a GM was able to go up to number seven, even though we had a preset trade built in with the Broncos that ended up, you know, falling through because they ended up taking Bradley Chubb. And he still was able to get up to number seven, get in front of the Arizona Cardinals to take Josh Allen. And then later we traded up with the Ravens to get Tremaine Edmonds. That draft, masterpiece. That, in my personal opinion, best move as a GM. What's yours? Uh, so you asked me, you know, three years ago, I, I would have said, you know, I loved everything he did, but he took the wrong Josh. Um, boy, was I wrong. Uh, got a couple buddies that don't let me live that down. My brothers. A lot of people reminding me on a regular basis that I, in fact, wanted Joshua Ballinger lipping cut. Uh, that's Josh Rosen's full name for anybody that doesn't know. 
Um, I did not know that. Joshua Bellinger Lippincott Rosen. Uh, that's his full yeah. name. And see, had I known that, I would have probably felt differently. Um, yeah. But to your question, um, my favorite bean move is kind of the the coming when he first came in, and it was this clearing out cap and like, are the Bills tanking and blah blah blah. All I mean, we backed into the playoffs that year and didn't look like we belonged. But it was in a year that everybody thought we were like literally tanking. Was right. the year that we broke the playoff drought? You know, we were clearing out. Um, we got rid of uh, Darby that year, Darius, Watkins, and it literally from the outside perspective, I was kind of hyped that we were clearing house and tanking. Like, let's do this. We we yeah. we've needed to do this for fifteen years, um, but really that set up the groundwork for everything he wanted to do after that. It was like we had to get rid of these bad contracts from Whaley and that just opened the door for everything that he wanted to systematically build after that. So it's kind of like a cop out big picture answer, but yeah. without without taking that risk in those moves in the first year, it doesn't set up everything we do after that. Right. So I would agree with you a hundred percent. I didn't even think about that entire process. Yeah, it's just like you know? it's like from the the second he walked in the door, he was like, mm-hmm. "Where are we going to be at in one year, three year, five year, ten year?" Mm-hmm. And big picture moves. You know, one of the things that likes to get discussed in Bills Mafia all over the place is the trading back to get Mo- or trading back, and we could have had Mahomes, but we ended up with Trey White. I know you wanted to put this to rest, but That's something that Bean gets, like, a bad rep for is that, well, he could have had Mahomes. but I got to interrupt you. Just because I'm pretty sure Brandon Bean was not a part of that draft. Yeah, Yeah, that was technically McDermott did the draft. You're right. Yeah. You're right. Yes, yes. And I I still think he did a fine job. Like, you look at that... You look at that class, most of them are signed to the roster. I kind of think uh, uh, if we're looking at that draft alone, I think McDermott should be a GM because <laughs> he crushed <laughs> he, it. He, yeah, he, he definitely crushed it. Now let's talk about some of the worst moves by Brandon Mean. And I'm going with Trent Murphy. Should have been gone. Could have had $9 million this year. It, and, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. There's no way he could have forecasted a pandemic coming in to drop the salary cap to where it is right now. So I'm not going to hold that against him, but for someone who was kind of consistently a healthy scratch, maybe we should have pulled the plug on him a little earlier. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to disagree with you here. Um, okay. The, the hindsight being 2020, it's, if we look at it today, yes, fully agree with you, but the move that they made at the time, um, I think they took Epinesa knowing that he was going to be a little bit of a developmental project and you kind of take exactly what you know you have in Trent Murphy and yes, the $9 million is a lot of money to have the luxury of knowing that, um, but you know, you, you could have seen Epinesa come onto the field and not do anything. You There was no training camp and at, at all that at the time. You know, at least you knew exactly what you had in Trent Murphy. Um, so for me, that was kind of like an overpriced insurance policy. And then just because of what happened in the whole crazy world of 2020, it ended up being a terrible move. But you couldn't have forecasted that at the time. So yeah, without all that in place, I, I didn't hate Trent Murphy being on the team. Um my biggest knock on Brandon Bean was Wyatt Teller, um, letting him get out the building. Um, in his defense, he pulled some capital back for a guy that was a cut candidate on the team. Mm-hmm. Um, but for me personally, that one stung a little bit more. So I remember going to a preseason game. No idea who we played. It was preseason. But I remember seeing Wyatt Teller on the sideline. I didn't know much about him. But this dude... Came off the field, he was done playing for the day, 
and he was just walking up and down the sidelines and just one at a time, everybody on the sideline, he was just tapping him on the shoulder and like asking him to do reps with him on the sideline. And like, he didn't stop for like the entire second half of the game. He was just up and down the sidelines working on his craft. And that's the type of thing that I love seeing from a guy in preseason. Like, you know, you see them take off their helmets. They got their hats on. They're all just waiting out the clock till, till it's over. This dude kept working. And so that it's something that I saw in that guy and, you know, they didn't see it. He wasn't likely to make the team anyway. So good move getting some capital back for it, but Mm -hmm. I would have liked to have him at guard over Feliciano right now. Yeah. And I, I get where you're coming from, but those kind of things are kind of hard to predict. And we got hindsight. Yeah, we definitely have hindsight. And during the time of the trade, I was all about it because I was thinking to myself, all right, this guy's not making the team, I guess. So we might as well get something from him. And I think about that center that we sent to New England for like Bodine. a six. Yeah, Bodine for like a six or a seven. Yeah, Ooh. and it's, it's the same situation, so I can't hate on him for it much. Yeah. You can't um, like one and then not like the other. Yeah, yeah. and you had a guy that wasn't going to make your team and you got capital for him, so... Right, you right. didn't expect Teller to turn into this all pro guard, and it is what right. it is. Well, now let's look at the other side of the coin. Let's talk about Sean McDermott, aka the hand clapper through thousand. <laughs> this guy claps like insane. I the one thing that I always appreciate about Sean McDermott is that he loves this growth mindset mentality. And it's something that I personally am a true believer in. And that this was before, you know, Sean McDermott came to the Bills. And it's basically, if you don't know what it is, it's that you can always be better and you can always improve yourself, but you have to push yourself to it, basically. And you got to go through some adversity and you you learn through failures. Don't look at a failure as a loss. Look at, at, look at, at, look at it. Sorry, can't speak as a learning opportunity and he brought what we all know as the process to western new york but like what does that even like mean though justin it is an omnipotent force that controls everything you believe i've always thought about this i'm i'm supposed to as a as a bills fan blindly follow someone who i just started doing research on and the only way that i'm i'm find solace in it is if he says just trust the process <laughs> like you know i mean i'm not hating on it i'm just saying what does that actually mean to you uh i mean at first it sounded kind of like hokey you know mm-hmm. um I heard a lot switching to basketball that the 76ers were always talking about the process yeah. Yeah. and like they were very clearly tanking and they were getting these top picks and all that. And it, it that's like an example of like, just trust the process and it never really panned out. Um, but what the bills are kind of cultivating with the process, I think goes a little bit more into like the culture Mm -hmm. and the way we're going to work. And, you know, it's not something that McDermott just comes in and expects from his players. It's something that he believes in himself and he's doing. Um, So I I think it kind of gets like this lumped in with, you know, it's just like coach speak type deal. But I think just watching the team on the field, you see that it's like, an actual mindset and the players are buying into it. And Mm -hmm. Sean McDermott is leading from the front. He's not saying like, I need you guys to improve and I'm good. He's openly like, I need to be better. You need to be better. We all need to be better. And that goes with like the, the playoff caliber and all, all of that, that they put out. And it just, seems like the mentality of the football team has really switched under Sean McDermott. Oh yeah. And I was kind of unsure 
of the hire at the time that we did it, there was just years of like, we've hired Wade Phillips, we hired uh, Doug Marone, and it was always kind of just like waiting for the next hire to be that guy. And then the Pagulas came in, and their first move was to hire the the clown of a coach, Rex Ryan. So, like, they kind of ruined my trust from the rip. And I was, you know, I'm looking at the next guy, and I'm like, who's Sean McDermott? Let's, let's look into him. And then over the next couple of years, you see, like, this dude couldn't be the more polar opposite oh, yeah. of Rex Ryan. It's like the Pagulas learned their lesson the hard way. Yeah, and when, well said, Sean McDermott is the exact opposite of Rex Ryan, and I love it. Everything in that building is tight-lipped. And I remember watching this clip of him talking to his players, like right when training camp first started. He's like, we don't recruit football players, we recruit people. And that spoke to me a lot. Because he, he's basically saying, I don't look at you as like a number. I look at you for who you are, and you got to be right for us. The fit between what we're looking for and you as a person has to be mutual in order for this to work. And you, you saw when he came in the mass exodus because a lot of those players that were there didn't fit that description. And I always think about the, the process like that flex tape meme or like yeah or like when somebody's like when the questions go door to door like hello sir are you do you have a moment to talk about the process <laughs> trying to convert you stuff like that we're gonna talk about the process oh uh, yeah well, well, i'm yeah in my personal opinion sean mcdermott's best move as a head coach there, there are so many, but I'm going to focus on his worst move as a head coach because it's funny to me. And that's definitely starting Nate Peterman against the Chargers. <laughs> the legendary five interceptions and a half. Worst head coach decision. And that was probably one time where I was like, well, I think he wants a mulligan on that. <laughs> Justin, what, what's your best move? By Sean McDermott and worst move as a head coach. Uh, so I'm gonna go kind of broad strokes on this again, and it sounds as, like as, it sounds like I go micro and you go macro with the big yeah, picture. Yeah, well, that's good though. Kind of, and I also kind of partially disagree with you on your last point, and it's gonna sound like heresy, but we'll get there. Um, Sean McDermott, my my favorite thing about him is how he's grown as a coach. And I don't think that it's really, I think it gets painted as like something that just happened, but I feel like it was more intentional than that. And his first year in, he was like this very conservative coach. Mm -hmm. He would never go for it on fourth down. He'd keep the challenge flag in his pocket. His game management was suspect, but like, as he's grown, the team has grown with him. So, you know, when you had Tyrod Taylor, Nate Peterman, Calvin Benjamin as your receiver, all this, you know, a fourth and one from your own 35, 40 yard line was more of a dangerous call than we can quarterback sneak, we can do a, a little rollout with Josh Allen, we can get a yard. It was more like, how are we going to get that yard? So I think my favorite thing about McDermott is watching him develop. And as far as the the worst coaching move I've seen from him, um, to your point, the Nate Peterman, it was an obvious terrible decision. Um, all that, I can't disagree with you there. But what I kind of low-key like about that move is – he was sitting in the driver's seat, and he kind of at that point acknowledged that Tyrod wasn't the guy. And he was kind of like, let's see if we have something with Peterman and carry on. He learned real quick that we didn't have anything in Peterman, and no. he went back. And, you know, that 
that's fine. It was kind of in a season where we weren't expecting anything. Mm -hmm. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that was the draft that McDermott put together no, with Peterman. No, no. no that oh. was the year before. No, I think you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He he drafted Nate Peterman, and yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah. So so this was a guy he took a shot on, mm -hmm. and he was like, "Let's see him on the field," you know. Yeah, I think we took and, him like in the fifth and sixth, and it was just yeah, like, the fifth round. Why not? Yeah, and and so at that point, it was kind of like, "Let's see what we have in this guy. If he has nothing, then we know he has nothing." Mm -hmm. But it, I, I think that kind of took some gumption from him because he had to know, like, if this doesn't go well, I'm going to get slaughtered for it. Oh, of course. But he did it anyways. And then we knew that Peterman wasn't the guy. And by starting Peterman, he was saying, we know Tyrod's not the guy. Right. So it kind of works into the, we're setting up for the next yeah. step of the process. Quote, air quotes and always air quotes the, this is the this is the beauty of the growth mindset his and i'll, I'll kind of work in your your answer here his worst move as a head coach in my personal opinion was the nate peterman move but he learned so much from that to your point that like hey right. he knows tyrod's not the guy he definitely knows um, Nate Peterman's not the guy now. He just set a record for like the most interceptions in a half, <laughs> and he he knew he he had to look at this situation and evaluate it and go like, okay, how can I get better? How can this team get better? Clearly, it's not with these two guys, <laughs> um, right? So, I don't know. I'm a big Sean McDermott fan. If you got the impression that I wasn't. That's that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying I, I would like to know a little bit more of what the process means. And I th again, that, I think that speaks to the polar opposite of what Rex Ryan was because he would just blatantly tell you everything. And everything at One Bill's Drive is just so tight-lipped. You don't know anything, which is perfect. I'm not trying to give out those secrets. Um, right. Anyways, that's going to wrap it up for Sean McDermott and Brandon Mean. But we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone. Let's wrap up the coaching staff by talking about the coordinators. Let's start first with the offensive side of the ball with Brian Dayball. He runs the Earhart, Earhart Perkins system. And to my understanding, it's the most complex offensive scheme you can have as an offense, but it can confuse the hell out of a defense. So I guess that's one of its perks. And it's concept-based. And for me, to see Josh Allen exceed so well in that system tells me that Josh Allen isn't a dummy, you know? He, he's good in the system, and he does well in it. So it seems like Josh Josh is good. He's an Earhart Perkins system kind of guy, but maybe he transcends beyond that. Um, I thought Brian Dayball was definitely going to be gone because it all signs pointed that he was going to take the Chargers head coaching position, but he also had a little bit of buzz because he got interviewed for the Cleveland job last year or two years ago, I believe, right? And he didn't get it either. So I, I don't know. Sometimes when I think about Brian Dayball, like he's he's had like two back to back off seasons of head coach head coaching buzz, but it just hasn't happened for him. Kind of like Eric Bamini. Why hasn't this happened? Is there something wrong with our with Brian Dayball? Is he just like not destined to be a head coach? I mean, he's probably going to get one. Don't get me wrong, Justin, but it just something that went through my mind. Like he's a great coordinator, but is he not a head coach? I don't know. What do What do you think? Yeah, I I first of all, I fully expected him to be gone this yeah. year. Um, 
I think part of part of why he hasn't gotten a head coaching job is some of those offensive minds are kind of like very lasered in savant like on that part of the part that part of the deal um i think s- some people interviewing are looking for like that bolstery leader of men like what Sean McDermott is that Dayball isn't you know you see Right, like Dayball kind of more behind the scenes and he's willing to call plays from up in the booth and he's not down there in the trenches. He's not clapping his hands and slapping his guys on the butt. Um, So I don't know if that's kind of what turns people off from him being a head coach. I do think he's going to get a job probably after this season. Um, But as far as Josh Allen's development, continuity, all that, he's been in the building he knows what Josh does well. Um, I've heard several times that, you know, the players really love Dayball because he'll listen to, you know, he might have this play that he really thinks is a home run hitter, and the players are like, we don't like that. And he's like, okay, then scrap it. Or Josh will tell him that he really likes running this play or this scheme, right. and he listens to that and leans into it. Um, so I'm – really glad he's back this right. year and they can kind of continue to mesh together and grow together. Um, but I mean, you see another season like that out of Josh and I don't know how people can deny him as a head coach somewhere else. Yeah. And I, I, I completely forgot about Abel's willingness to take on the feedback of his offensive players when constructing a game plan or the offensive playbook in general, like when Josh doesn't like anything to your point, uh, a specific play, he scraps it and he was like, all right, let's toss in some more stuff that you do like. And it's obviously worked because Josh had an MVP like year. <laughs> so I'm all for Brian Dayball. He, he's, he's real cool in my book. And I, I agree with you. I fully anticipate that he's gone after next year. And if he isn't, I don't really know. What a, why he wouldn't get the job. Maybe he's just not a good interviewer. Maybe he gets the yips. Um, but, hey, if we can have him here for five years in a row with Josh, that's great continuity. So yeah. I that will wouldn't say, be the worst thing. I will say with Dayball, I would like to see just a better scheme, execution, whatever you want to call it, of the run game. And very much to say... You know, I'm not advocating for more run game. Mm-hmm. We've been seeing, you know, successful running games for dozens of years, and it didn't lead to success. I'm all for getting with the modern NFL and leading into the passing game and all that. Yeah. Um, just when we want to use the run game, I'd like to see it be more effective. And I don't know if that was scheme, if it's, you know, I think if it's... it's I- I think Running it's a back. blend of scheme and personnel, and we're we're transitioning from power to the zone read, and we have power linemen. Right. And so, so I, I would th- like I think to see that stuff a, comes with time. Yeah, and I I would just like to see you know a step forward in that department. Yeah. Um, I don't want a running back at thirty. <laughs> you know, my last comment about Brian Dable is. I don't know if you remember this. I think it was Josh's rookie year, and we he ran out of the pocket and threw this deep pass to Charles Clay, who drops it in the end zone. And if you look at the replay, Brian Dayball is standing on the sidelines, and when Charles Clay drops his ball, Brian Dayball drops to his knees and on the floor like he got shot by a sniper. Wow. <laughs> Definitely one of my favorite moments for Brian Dayball. But let's flip to the other side of the ball and talk about Leslie Frazier, someone who has been a head coach, and he's so good at his position. And I think the organization looks at Leslie so highly that he's an assistant head coach in addition to his you know, duties as a defensive coordinator. I love Leslie Frazier, and I think McDermott and him work so well together in terms of like cooking up 
uh, defensive schemes. He's like the sous chef, and McDermott's like the head chef when when coming up with plans. And I think the best, I guess, meal that they put out or scheme plan was against the Ravens. Masterful. You you held a playoff team to three points. That that just doesn't happen ever. You know that that yeah, wind was there, but still that was that was a really impressive feat to do. And you know, there were some times where some of the defensive schemes didn't work out that well, and then you could point to both of those Chiefs games. But for the most part, I think Leslie Frazier has done an outstanding job. And I, I, I just don't know how you feel about him, Justin. How do you feel? Yeah, I, I think he's kind of like underrated. But also, if we're going to lose a, a coach on our coaching staff, I think he's the most uh, replaceable. Um, I think we don't really talk enough about like, where we matched up poorly this year, mostly defensively, was the two Chiefs games, which everybody struggles with the Chiefs, and then like a weird Titans game. And, you know, the Titans' bread and butter is the play action, and Derrick Henry just shoving the ball down your throat. And I'm pretty sure for a team that was bad at run defense this past year, I think we held Derrick Henry to like 57 yards. It was something like that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, with a weird off season, we had a lot of moving pieces, a lot of new guys coming in. Um, the Star Latulale opt out. You know, a lot of things happened this year that were unexpected. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd like to see a couple more tools in his tool belt. Um, but he's another guy. I thought for sure he was taking the Texans job. I thought it. I thought that was him. And yeah, they came up with David Cully, like yeah, you, you know, in very something similar, weird. Yeah, very similar to Brian Dayball. There was some buzz that you know Leslie Frazier, even last year, not including this off season, including this off season, there was some buzz like, oh, could he could he get plucked for a head coaching position? And I, I think that just kind of, I mean. I don't know how David Coley will be as a head coach, but I, if I'm the GM of the Texans, how do you pick David Coley? Like the Ravens, they say they want better, you know, offensive performance for like Deshaun Watson. Then you pick David Coley from the Ravens, and they literally were the lowest ranking wide receiver performing team, and he ran that whole thing. And in my head, I think to myself, like, okay, well, I'm happy that Leslie Frazier's back, but why didn't he get the job? Did he say something wrong? Is there something wrong with Leslie Frazier? Or is it just, like, the inept ineptitude of the Houston Texans that were like, we could have someone that's like Leslie Frazier, but we're going to get... David Cully instead. Boom. What do you think yeah. about that plot twist? For me, that's, uh, I think that speaks more to the ineptitude of whatever's going on in Houston right now. Mm-hmm. It, it's crazy that two years ago, was well, yeah, two years ago, they were, they were stomping the Chiefs in the AFC Championship game. And it's like halftime of that game happened and then just, yeah. The wheels ripped off of the entire organization. It's just the beginning of the end. It's it's crazy how fast it can happen, but mm-hmm. you know David Culley's been around for a long time. He's respected by a lot of people. I just don't think it was really the right move, but mm-hmm. I was I was more shocked to see Brian Dable not get a job over Leslie Frazier. Um all these teams are looking for like that next young offensive mind that can just develop a quarterback, put a whole system together, go out and score 30, 40, 50 points a game, and you win games that way. And that's like modern NFL. Right. Um, Leslie, Leslie Frazier to me is a little bit more old school. 
So it didn't surprise me as much, but when he's a little bit more old school and then you went like old, old school, mm-hmm. I don't know what the Texans are doing, but that's a story for a different day. Yeah, well, regardless, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm so happy to have Leslie Frazier back. Let's transition to the last coordinator, Heath Fardwell. Special teams coordinator, Justin. I, you know, when when the Bills hired him, I was just like, oh, well, here comes another Carolina Panther coordinator. Like, oh God. And I, but you know, one thing I like about Heath Fardwell is his hands-on approach. He's willing to get his hands dirty to show you how to do it because he was a player and a damn good special team player at that. And ever since Brandon Bean has come into the fold and ever since Heath Farrell came into the fold, there's been a clear emphasis of the development of special teams. It's not just been so lopsided offense, defense. Now, now you see us specifically getting players for special teams, right? Um, I don't know why his name is escaping me, but the linebacker we signed out of Pittsburgh. Medikevich. Yeah, Medikevich, like, the old Bills regimes would have never done that whatsoever. We would have just like thrown like just random people out there who don't know how to coordinate a field return and just hope for the yeah. best. And, that, and that's something I really like about this team, this organization right now, is they see all the phases of the game mm-hmm. and special teams isn't like, yeah, let's survive that. Mm-hmm. Like that's a key part of the game. And they emphasize that. And every once in a while, you know, I'm looking at like some money tied up, tied up in a special teams ace, and I'm like, we could save that money. And then I realize that this is why they have the jobs they have, and I'm not as smart as I think. You think about a guy like Medikavich, um Daryl Johnson sticking around on the roster as like a rotational DN, but he impacts special teams. You think about um, Jaquan Johnson. I don't want to see him play any extended time at safety, but he goes out there and he does special teams, and he does it well. Saran Neal, same thing. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like these depth positions that we have on the team are setting Heath Farwell up for success as well. And, you know, he's not just getting some outcast hopefully this guy can turn into something someday i think he has a voice in the room that's saying like especially like the later round picks fifth sixth seventh round he's like i want this 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 guy can impact special teams i need this guy and i think they're listening to that oh yeah definitely well we'll definitely have to see what happens now that andre roberts is gone who was a special team stud and also went to the Texans, so maybe he can help them. <laughs> but we'll see. So, Justin, let's play a quick game of uh, Kill or Mary. And in terms of coordinators, where do you where do you have those people lined up? All right. So I am f-ing Heath Farwell. Um, I think he does a great job. All that, I think um, his position is the most fleeting in that he's kind of a, a beneficiary of t- the team focusing on giving him players to work with. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm marrying Brian Daywall. Um, I think the longer you can keep the same offensive system in place, um, continue working the same things with Josh Allen, um, you know what works, what doesn't work, what we need to improve on. Mm-hmm. I think Josh Allen is the most important piece to this team right now. So the better dynamic there versus starting from scratch with somebody new, I think right. that's the most beneficial. Uh, sorry, Leslie. It's nothing personal. I got to kill off Leslie Frazier. Um, I think, I think him and McDermott do a great job, as you alluded to before, of working together and you know putting together a game plan it's so much more than just game day it's 
it's the whole week leading into game day yeah. of you know what they want to do and especially with you know you got you lack some athleticism on defense, so a lot of what they're doing is scheming up ways of overcoming that to put together a good game plan. But right. if I have to get rid of one of them, my most replaceable is Leslie Frazier. And then uh, I have a caveat because I don't want to leave him out. I want to be best friends with Sean McDermott. I think he would just make me a better person overall. He'd be clapping me up. Positive Way to get up for work. Sense. You woke up on your first alarm today, Justin. Let's go. It's going to be a good day. Right. So if I had to do this. Yeah, you have to. Um, you know, it's funny. I I wrote down, like, oh, we should play this game, but I didn't even write my own answer. And I didn't, oh. I didn't even think about it until right now. Go. I'm, I'm going for it. So if I had to, uh, no, I'm not. You know, keep one of them around for a night. I'll say it like that. I, oh, you didn't give me that option. Well, you, you just came out guns blazing. I'm not. I'm not here to hold you back. I was ready. <laughs> I, I see that. So if I'm just gonna keep one of them around just for one night, and this is like number two spot for me, I think the Mary is number one. So, you know, all right, I'll start with the Mary. I would marry. Leslie Frazier. Mm, okay. He plays a big role in in terms of defense. He's assistant head coach, so you know he's integral in terms of leadership. And I think that leadership has gotten us to where we are. And he's been in this process for over four four years now. So that those are my re- my synopsis of reasons why i'm having him and the mary the person i'm gonna put in the number two spot the the person i'll keep for the night see this can go either way with me i i guess i'll put brian dable there and for the kill i'll put heath farrell there and i i'll I'll say this it can go either way for me because I think I, I I truly honestly believe that Josh Allen has helped transcend Brian Dayball's offensive scheme. There are things that Josh Allen can do that you're not supposed to do, and I think that that has helped elevate Brian Dayball so much so that we think of him and think of him as this god tier coordinator when in the past when he was a coordinator i I think he was the coordinator for the dolphins and stuff it it didn't go that well in his other coaching opportunities it didn't go that well and all of a sudden he just comes to the bills and he's just he figures it out and he's like doing great i don't know i don't know oh and it it for me personally, I could, if we lost Brian Dable, I would be confident that whoever comes in could take Josh Allen and Stefan Diggs, Cole Beasley, and the other offensive weapons that we have and could have some success. And if you can't, then you should have never been an offensive coordinator. <laughs> you know, we have yeah, some and- cornerstone pieces. I don't know. And and I don't really the way the game is set up. I I got to kill one of them, honestly. Yeah. For you know, if it could be like keep somebody around for a night, marry somebody, or like have a lifelong friendship, you know, I'd keep all three of them around. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's just not the way the game plays, man. You know, we we saw success in the past season. Um, we had our we had our pluses and minuses. You know, every team has weaknesses, mm-hmm. but the sum of all the parts, that coaching staff, yeah. the general manager, the players on the field, all that came together for the best football that we've seen in right. 20 years. Um, so, honestly, I want all of them to be around for a long time and all that. Yeah. But for the sake of the game, sorry, Leslie, you got to go. Yeah. 
it's, it's so funny. You have him on the bottom of yours, but he's at the top of mine. Yeah. But hey, that that just means that we we have some disagreement. That's all right. But that's perfectly fine. We're able to talk about it. That's what happens. And anyway, you know what? I'm going to change my order again. So it's I'm marrying Leslie Frazier. <laughs> I'm keeping Heath Farwell, and I'm killing Brian Dable. Jeez. For the well, aforementioned reasons. All right, here we go. And are. I might catch some slack for that, but that's just how I feel. And if you got a problem with it, we can talk about it. <laughs> I assume you also want to be lifelong friends with Sean McDermott. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's pretty cool. He's a pretty cool guy. And, I again, I, I embody a lot of his you know, uh, euthanisms in terms of the growth mindset. So, And I carry that definitely near and dear to me so he he would be a good person to be a role model i'm sure his kids have a great role model as a father and the the clapping of course of course i'm trying to aggressively not clap into my microphone <laughs> well i'm sure jake would enjoy uh editing that out Just pop, pop, pop. right right anyways i think that's gonna wrap it up for this week's episode Check out our podcast next week where we're going to recap the NFL draft. I know Justin's so excited for it. I am too. But before you go check out that episode and before you close out this one, go ahead and subscribe, like, and comment and review our podcast. It'd be greatly appreciated. We want to know how we're doing and how we can be better for you, the listeners. We're always looking for guests on the show, so reach out to us on social media platforms. Or give us an email by searching The Wandering Buffalo Podcast. Justin, where can the people find you? You can find me on social media at jgods22. Um, we're on draft week. If anybody wants to send over a last-minute draft, send it to the show. Send it to me. I just I love seeing what other people have in mind versus you know where my thought process is. It's always good to see a little bit of different insight see if i'm missing something see if we're missing something so let us know where you stand maybe we can talk about it pre-draft post-draft we'll get around to it absolutely and you can find me on social media platforms by searching two janks that's going to wrap it up for this week's episode uh justin go bills go bills